Hi. As you know, my little microcurrent project has been very popular lately and uh, I need to get some more manufactured because, uh, you know, there's been a pretty big demand for them. And I've been uh, selling this for quite a few years now and uh, I've only got them made in small batches. I never originally designed this for high volume manufacture at all. So I've just been making, you know, 50 was my first batch and then, well, I made another 50, another 50, little small batches of, of 50 or thereabouts. But I wanted, I thought, oh, no, it's just not the right way to do it. I'm now actually selling quite a few of these things. So I thought, might as well do it properly and rejig this thing for a bit more uh, friendly for high volume manufacture. Now, I've done a whole uh, video on this. It's uh, DFM, what's called Design for Manufacturing. And there's a link up here, so click on this if you haven't seen the previous video. It's a long one, goes into all detail about how to panelize stuff for production and things like that. But um, that's all it was, talk. I didn't actually um, give you a real world design example. So I thought I'd do just that. I'm going to rejig this thing for production. I'll make it more friendly for machine uh, assembly. And I thought I'd just actually show you what goes into that. It's not that hard, but should be interesting. So stick around. So here's the microcurrent as a bareboard uh, unit over here as a fully assembled PCB. When I get it back from the manufacturer, this is what it uh, looks like. And this is the finished uh, product tested and ready to ship. Now let's take a look at uh, what's involved with actually um, uh, panelizing this as opposed to a loose version. Now as you can see the uh, PCB is designed into fit into this uh, jiffy box here and it's designed uh, as a front panel so the appearance of these uh, outside edges here is actually uh, quite important in this particular product. So you have to put a th bit of thought into how you actually uh, panelize this actual design because um, currently I get it manufactured like this. I get it manufactured from a company in China called PCB Cart, but uh, I'm going to drop them. I'm going to try and get it um, locally uh, manufactured or manufactured somewhere other than China. So I'm going to give that a go um, just to locally source it. Now, uh, this is when you lay out the board in your uh, CAD software, as we'll see later, it's just an individual board like this, or what's called a loose board from the manufacturer. When you uh, send your Gerber files away to be manufactured, you specify them, either you want them panelized or you want them loose, supplied loose like this. And the way they do it is they will route these edges, they will they will actually panelize this on a larger board, but then they will actually uh, route it out with a drill and you'll get a beautifully finished board with a nice smooth routed edge, beautifully sharp corners on it, and it just looks really nice for a front panel. And that's great, but it's not very suitable for high volume manufacture because if you've just got a single PCB like this, then uh, when you stick it in a pick and place machine, especially one this small, then you're not full, fully utilizing uh, the available uh, the available time on that pick and place machine because it can only pick and place one individual board and then it's got to move through so that moves through the conveyor belt like this under the pick and place machine pick and place machines loaded it loads all the components for one board and boom off it goes and really that is no good if you're just assembling one of these at a time because uh, you've got uh, it comes in and places all the parts and goes to the uh, reflow oven and then it's just got to reflow that one individual board and uh, this board doesn't have any uh, outside uh, tooling uh, strips around the outside of the board as we'll see later so that it can um, automatically uh, get inserted and moved along the conveyor belt. Typically if you get a loose board like this they might have to design a like a custom jig for it where the board just sits in. It could be made of wood or uh, you know ABS or uh, something else but it's like a carrier board that sits in there and takes the board along. So you're not using your pick and place machine very efficiently if you're just getting one board made at a time. So what we want is to get multiple boards made at a time, let's say 10 at a time, and then you're really utilizing the time available on that pick and place machine. Because during uh, high volume assembly, what you'll pay for is you'll pay for the setup of the machine, you'll pay a fixed 
setup costs typically, and then you'll pay for the machine uh, time itself or how long that machine takes to assemble your particular board. That's in general. Uh, it, it varies by the uh, assembler, but generally that's how it's going to work. So if you can do 10 boards at once instead of one, you're going to go through that machine much quicker and your assembly cost is going to be cheaper per board. Now, here's an example of a typical uh, PCB manufacturing panel. It's exactly the same board, but it's duplicated in this time, in this case, uh, three, uh, three uh, vertical by four horizontal, 12 boards total. So in the one manufacturing pass, you can do 12 boards at once. It's roughly an A4 uh, size sheet, which is any uh, good assembler machine should be able to handle that. If you want to go much larger than that, talk to your assembler first because you don't want to goof it up, manufacture this huge panel trying to fit 100 boards on there, and oops, it doesn't fit into their automated machine. So just check first. But A4 size like this, generally pretty good. So we want to get, say, uh, multiple versions of this microcurrent on a panel like this. So we should be able to fit, say, five across by two like that. So 10 boards, that will be our aim. Nice round number. I like it. Now, the other thing you have to consider is how you actually attach the board to the panel. You can, of course, just copy and paste your Gerber on there and get it manufactured as one big solid board, but that's pretty useless because then you'd have to have access to some sort of uh, routing machine that could cut the board out after it's assembled, and that's a pain in the butt. So what you want to do is uh, when you panelize a board like this, you want to add some uh, routing paths like this and some little tab attachments in there to put the board in or you want to do what's called uh, V grooving which in this case say this uh, particular panel here there's these score marks down the side and you can just snap the boards off and of course you can actually do a combination of routing like this or a V grooving like as an example on this board here it's got uh, one routing bit along here one routing path along there to get the reason you put in a routing path instead of a V grooving is to get a nice smooth edge like I call, talked about. You want a nice smooth edge. If you want a nice smooth edge, say on this side, for some particular reason because it's visible inside your product, then you would route it out like that. But if you don't care about the other edges, then you just put uh, specify V grooving which puts a score mark in there and then you can come along later and then just snap this board out. Now of course if I did the microcurrent board like this with these little tabs in there that you have to cut out with a pair of side cutters afterwards and it typically leaves a really ugly looking dag on on the corner like that or you can put them in the middle like here if you want but that's even uglier because you've got to put in a little sort of bit of cut out in there and I won't go into details but when you cut it out it looks ugly and that's okay if your board's inside your product and people aren't going to see it but when it's actually a front panel like this, then the edges can actually be quite important, the visible edges like that. So um, ideally, we want as much as these edges routed as much as possible. So for this microcurrent, I figure that these longer edges here are, you know, quite uh, prominent and visible. So I would prefer to have those edges down there fully routed so they're nice and smooth and then just say V groove the top like that because I don't want daggy edges in there with the tabs so I think I'll rule out tabs completely and I'll go with just uh, a routing path down the side of the board like this the long side and then the top side I will do V grooving like that just like on this particular board here I've done V grooving uh, sorry uh, routing down the side just imagine this is my microcurrent board I want to do routing down the side like that so I get nice smooth edges and then that V groove that scored V groove mark along the top like that and as I've explained in the previous video I'll just mention it again there's a bit of an art to choosing uh, you know how to strengthen these particular tabs and things like that because when the pick and place machine comes along and then pushes down your component down onto the board the board can warp uh, particularly if you've got um, very uh, thin PCB this is standard 1.6 millimeter that I'm using here but you might use a 0.8 millimeter board or even thinner like that and they're very very flexible so um, there's a bit of an art which goes into that, but if you just do V grooving, V grooving is, you know, usually, you know, is really strong enough for almost uh, anything. They've 
the PCB manufacturers have got the V-grooving down to an art where, you know, it just works. You can easily snap it out, but it's more than strong enough. There's more than enough fibers inside that V-grooving there to actually uh, hold the board in place, no problems at all, with a lot of force. And the other thing we're going to want are tooling strips top and bottom of our board like this, so that um, these, and you've got tooling holes like that, typically 3.2 millimeters in diameter would be a typical tooling hole, and you want these fiducial marks as well. A fiducial mark will be a typical one millimeter diameter uh, circle or thereabouts with the solder mask removed around it. So that's a vision identification alignment point for the pick and place machine and you want to put those on the outside of the board and you'll see that the entire panel like this has typically four tooling holes in the corners like that and it will have uh, usually uh, three um, uh, fiducial marks like that top and bottom so you want them on the bottom side as well and especially for this microcurrent considering there's no point having fiducial marks on the top side of the board because all my components mounted on the bottom so when they put this machine through when they put this board through the pick and place machine it's going to be facing up this way so and your camera your fiducial camera is going to be typically on the top here so if your fiducial marks on the bottom that's no good to you so you want to make sure your fiducial markers on the side of the board that your components are don't get confused now as you can see there really aren't a lot of components on this board so you can argue that well you know I could if I'm only making you know, 50 or 100 or maybe even 200 you could uh, actually hand assemble these and I do actually currently get these hand assembled by a guy in Melbourne uh, his name's uh, Vutronics so um, and he just hand assembles these individual boards and that's okay for a run of 50 because when you're uh, doing machine pick and place assembly, you're going to pay quite a large uh, setup cost to actually tool up for that. And as we'll talk about in a minute, you've got to buy reels of components instead of individual ones. So if you're only going to get 50 of some board manufactured, it's really not worth panelizing them. But now I think I'm going to go to the trouble to do it because that's professional. It's a proper way to do it. And if I sell more of these in the future, it's going to be better. Might be a bit of uh, upfront uh, cost now to get it uh, set up and panelized. I can lose the components in terms of, um, like I might have to buy 500 to one component, even though I'm going to make 100 or 200 boards. But in the end, uh, hopefully if I sell enough, I should recoup the cost and it should be lower cost to get this machine assembled instead of hand assembled. And of course, the other thing to watch out for is how many different types of components you got on the board. Thankfully, this is only a very simple board. As you can see, there's only three ICs. There's 12, you know, a dozen resistors or so, three caps, you know, a couple of ICs and this uh, surface mount battery, battery connector. And that's about it. So uh, really, I'm not going to, even if these, all the resistors were all different values, I'm not going to exceed the maximum number of reels available on the machine because um, I don't want my board to have to go through the pick and place machine twice. Let's say the pick and place machine at your particular assembler only supports 20 different reels of components. That means, well, you're limited to having a maximum of 20 different types of components, not 20 components total, but different types on your particular design. So um, if you've got more than that, what your assembler is capable of, you may have to rejig your design and consolidate some of your components. Like uh, you might go around and consolidate some of your resistor values or something like that so that you can actually um, uh, get this board in a single run through the pick and place machine because that will be cheaper. So what happens at the moment? Well, I order 50 loose PCBs like this from uh, PCB cart in China. They're very cheap. I get 50 of these. Then I order 50 of all my required components from DigiKey and they come all loose like this and you know these there's the battery connector it comes in a non machine friendly uh, you know thing like this hold up like this and really you can't put this into an automated pick and place machine and and place the damn things are only good for hand soldering and each individual component comes in the individual little bags like that they're cut off from the reel as you can see they're just chopped off like that and they're, that's only good for hand solder. So my assembler, Vutronics, he's got to sit there and take them all out of their individual things and place them down with tweezers and solder them. And does a pretty good job and does it really quick, which is excellent. But that's really only good 
for low volume stuff. If you, when you start talking 100 or 200 or more, like a thousand boards, perhaps not that I'm going to make a thousand, but a couple of hundred of these things, then you really want to look into uh, pick and place, actually buying your components that are machine friendly. If you went to a machine assembler, even if you've got your lovely panelized board like this, you send them your lovely, you know, you've done all the work to panelize the thing and you send them a bunch of parts like this, they're gonna laugh at you. And, well, secretly laugh at you behind their back because then they're gonna have to take all these out and then individually, um, uh, individually uh, wind these onto their own reels and they'll charge you a fortune for that, an absolute fortune. So. What we want to do is we don't want to buy them loose like this. Forget that, that's hopeless. So we want to ditch all that rubbish and we only want things on reels or in uh, tubes of components. Usually the manufacturers prefer reels like this. They don't uh, in particular like uh, tubes anymore. They're not as good or trays of components. So really, say these um, surface mount battery holders, you can actually get them in uh, trays and they supply them as one big tray like that and they can sort of load those into some pick and place machines and pick them from trays but not nearly as good as buying them on a reel. So you can actually buy these on a reel like this. It's a really thick reel like that. It's going to be about that thick and it might have say 500 of these on the one particular reel and they can load those in to their pick and place machine on their reels like this it might hold 20 30 or 50 reels of components and bingo the tape goes into the machine like this and it actually uh, assembles those really quickly and really efficiently with the minimum amount of handling so every single component i've got to go through my bill of materials i've got to go back to digikey and i've got to look at buying each part on a reel. Now, if you're buying a capacitor or a resistor, they're, you know, 0.1 cents each. They're really cheap. You buy a reel like this, it's only 10, 15, 20 bucks. Not a problem. Even if you only want to make a couple hundred boards, you can waste, you can afford to waste a couple of thousand uh, components because each reel might have four or five thousand resistors or four or five thousand capacitors on it. That's not a problem. But some of the ICs, um, uh, could be uh, quite expensive. So uh, companies like uh, Digikey and Mouser, they offer a re-reeling service. So instead of buying a full reel, uh, let's say I've got to buy the uh, the Max um, IC on here. Very, you know, it's the most expensive part on the board. It's like a dollar or a dollar fifty or something like that. You don't want to buy a couple of thousand of them on a reel like this, a full reel, what's called a full reel, if you only want to make a couple of hundred boards. That, so you can actually, um, this isn't. This is a reasonable example of what you'll get. It's actually a mini reel. Um, it's a brand name. I think this is a Farnell one, but the DigiKey one, or this comes from the manufacturer actually, but DigiKey, they'll offer a re-reeling service where they take all of these components off a larger reel and they put it onto a smaller reel. So if you only want 200, they'll take 200 off this reel like this and they'll rewind it onto a smaller reel and you only have to pay for those 200 parts plus like you might pay eight or ten dollars for uh, a, a re-reeling fee but that's okay then you don't get a huge amount of wastage but once you've got these you can ship those to your uh, uh, PCB assembler and they'll be happy as Larry that you've given them all the components perfectly on reels like this and they'll love you and they won't charge you a premium. Now the other thing is uh, you will lose some of the components off these reels so don't go giving your manufacturer exactly the right amount of components that they need. If you're getting 200 boards manufactured do not go and give them exactly 200 devices on this reel. Make sure you have some extra because they will actually lose some components and they have to add some leader tape on there as well so they, they will actually um, add some tape on top of that some extra length so that it can actually be fed into their machine wound on first before it gets to the components but if your components start right here they can't just stick that into their machine because it's going to get wound through and you're going to waste the first you know 50 components or something like that so it's very common so you have to have some uh, overrun on your reels just make sure you order 
you know, 10% more or, you know, 50 components more for resistors or capacitors or something like that. Don't do an exact number. And of course, unfortunately, the microcurrent board isn't all surface mount. It's got a couple of through-hole switches on the top here, plus these binding posts and these 4mm banana plugs here, and they still have to be hand-soldered. So, um, really, you know, there's they could actually selectively wave-solder these switches, but I doubt they would actually go to the effort to really do that. So, considering they have to hand-solder other stuff, they'd hand-solder those switches as well so uh, you've got to factor that into the cost you'll pay um, you know a fair bit extra for that individual uh, hand solder process but hopefully we should be able to save um, quite a bit of cost even even if we manufacture a couple hundred of these boards should be able to save enough cost to uh, compensate for the fact that we're um, uh, going to have to hand solder a few extras but I think we can save some money maybe the you know the price uh, benefit might start at maybe 100 boards or 200 but uh, after that it would really kick in to play and save you a big cost and also uh, with machine assembly of the components there's less chance of it going wrong and your soldering quality is going to be more consistent as well not that my uh, hand solder of Vutronics does a bad job does an excellent job in fact and of course the other thing that the uh, manufacturer is going to charge you for unless you supply it yourself I wouldn't recommend you supply it yourself usually you leave it up to the manufacturer is the solder paste stencil and that will um, be usually a stainless steel one for high volume manufacture with all the cutouts of all the pads so that they can apply the solder paste on there and um, that might be absorbed into the um, uh, setup fee or something like that or they could even charge you extra for that but once again, that's only a one-off cost for that stainless steel stencil. And they do uh, wear out, so if you're manufacturing a million boards or something, you know, they're eventually going to wear out. But when you're, you know, assembling this sort of quantities, I'm after the hundreds or even the thousands, you know, it's really not going to be a problem. So just leave it up to the manufacturer. All right, so let's actually take a look at how we do this in the PCB package. Now, before anyone asks, this is Altium Designer, okay? Don't ask how to do it in any other package because well that's up to you to figure out okay this is just how i'm going to do it in altium designer now this is my existing microcurrent board and uh, i've actually um tweaked the uh, i've taken the opportunity to tweak the uh, uh silk screen on the front here i've increased the size of the microcurrent font added ev blog there because this uh, design was from before I was uh, actually started the EEV blog, so I didn't put it on there. But I thought I'd just uh, take the opportunity, seeing as that I am actually paying for a retooling of this PCB, because I used to get it supplied in this individual thing like this. So you have to, which means if I want to panelize it, I'm going to have to pay a new uh, tooling charge. So you may as well add in any other changes. There's no circuit changes, so I'm happy with that. I'm just going to change this silk screen. On the front so this is how I supplied the board uh, previously is just the Gerbers for this one individual file and if we actually go in there and we can actually generate the uh, Gerbers for those now let's actually do that as a I won't go into inches and millimeters and all that sort of stuff let's just generate the Gerbers shall we and uh, have a look at Bang, there it is, there's the Gerbers. And if we take a look here, we can actually see the individual uh, Gerber layers like that. That's the bottom layer, hence GBL. That's the bottom overlay, like that. The bottom solder mask, the bottom mechanical layer. As you can see, I defined the outline of my board. Actually, don't worry about the switches, that was just part of a model for that component. But I defined the outline of my board based on a separate mechanical layer. So when the manufacturer imports all of these uh, layers, they will all match up and overlay, and they know exactly, because they're based on the same origin, down in the uh, bottom corner down here, they will know that uh, that is the dimensions of my board that I want. And because I haven't specified any panel information or anything else, they're just gonna supply that board loose, like um, just uh, like we talked about. So. There's the overlay. So let's actually look at getting this thing panelized. So in my project here over the left-hand side, what I've got is my schematic 
of course, and then I've got my individual PCB here. I've generated this, it's exactly the same as before, but then I've created a new uh, PCB inside this um, PCB thing, and this is inside my PCB project, and there is my completed panel. I've already done it, of course. Here's one I prepared earlier, and uh, I'll go through the steps and explain exactly what I've done here. Okay, so the first thing you're going to want to do is just create a blank panel size that's big enough for the amount of boards that you want. Uh, in the case of the microcurrent, it's uh, 79 millimeters high by 50 millimeters wide. That's the individual board. So uh, I can calculate, um, simple math, how big my panel needs to be. But you can tweak it later. You can drag the corners in and uh, uh, tweak the sizes. But uh, you create a blank panel like that, and then you start uh, laying down your individual PCBs into the panel board. Now, of course, the old school way to do this is just to cut and paste your entire board. So you go into your individual board and then you actually uh, make sure all of the layers you want are actually selected, that they're all there. You can go used all on or whatever. So all your layers are there and you can just highlight everything or select uh, all and then you just copy it. Make sure you choose the bottom uh, corner down here, for example, and then bang, I've copied that and I go into my panel and I can then paste in my individual board and you can see the actual size of it there and bang, you can paste there, rebuild the polygons. You typically do not want to rebuild your polygons and then you can paste individual boards. You can actually go in there and make sure, set your default grid and things like that just to make sure that you actually get it um, accurate like that. But that's really... Um, that's really the old school way to do it. And you've got to be uh, careful that um, it doesn't uh, duplicate, uh, for example, doesn't duplicate your silkscreen designators and things like that. Some packages will automatically, see, it has, Outium Designer. If we go in here, see that uh, it's back to front, mirror image there. But if we go in, see, it's actually relabeled those silkscreens. That's just the individual component designators. It's relabeled those. So that's a bit of a trap for young players when you're doing it manual like this. There is an option somewhere in Outium Designer to disable that sort of thing. It's increment designators on paste or something like that. But uh, um, So some packages without a panelization feature, you are going to have to do it manually like that. But thankfully, Outium Designer has a panelization feature, so we're going to use that instead. So let's use this panelization feature. So let's go into uh, place and then embedded board array panelize like this. And you can set up your uh, individual distances between boards. Now I know my board is, uh, you know, I can actually tweak these uh, figures later, but it's 55 millimeters um, in the X direction to the next board and then 90 millimeters vertical to the board after that. And then you can specify which uh, PCB file you want. <coughs> want. In this case, we've only got one, which is the microcurrent, the, the column count, the row count, and bingo, if we do that, look what we've got. We've instantly got our panel there which we can place on our board and what that does is it actually it it really it doesn't actually place the individual tracks um, on that board is that a bug there that's some sort of bug in Outium Designer what a load of crap anyway um, it doesn't actually place down the actual tracks and the silk screen and everything else it just place places down the information placement information for them so that when you generate the Gerber files later, it will actually generate the full panel, which is really quite a neat way to do it. I like it, but there you go. That's how easy it was. Okay, so what we've got now, we've actually placed our individual board array like this, and I've set the uh, dimensions, the distance between one board and the next to be precisely um, 2.4 millimeters wider than um, than the board itself. So that width in there is 2.4 millimeters. Why I've done that is because 2.4 millimeters is a standard routing uh, bit width. So what the manufacturer can do is just route out, bang, that um, they can route out that slot straight up there with one pass of the routing bit. They can route any size you want, um, but they, you know, it's just nicer if they can do it just in one routing path like that. So that's what I'm going to do. So we'll have to specify the routing paths later. But basically, as you can see, I've um, I've uh, created my panel there. Now let's take a look at that in the 
3D mode like this, and bang, there it is. There's my actual board, and if we, uh, we can actually uh, play around with that, and uh, there we go. That's what our board is actually going to look like, well, our final panel is going to look like, as opposed to our individual board. And as you can see, there's no, um, uh, because it's not easy to show the routed uh, slots on here, you have to use your imagination a bit. Um, but uh, what we've done there is we've created one big panel with 10 individual microcurrent boards. Now, you know how I said there were no circuit changes? Well, I kind of lied there because uh, there actually are. And uh, what they are is, let me go down to the bottom layer here. Now, in the previous version of the board, I won't uh, bother opening it, but this uh, blue trace up here was actually much closer to the edge of the board up here. And that's usually not a problem if you're actually cleanly routing those boards. But because we want to V-groove the top uh, edge and the bottom edge of the board, it was the same uh, down the bottom here as well. This uh, trace was actually down near the bottom of the board down there. So um, what we've had to do is uh, peel that back a bit, move that trace down a bit so it's so there is some uh, clearance a decent amount of clearance between the top of the board there and I've left about one and a half millimeters I think by the looks of that and uh, that should be enough for the V groove to go along because what the V groove or V scoring does is it gets a little drill bit and it goes and it routes a um, a, a groove or a V groove funny that it routes a V groove right along there so you actually cut into some of this board here. So you're also going to cut in to some of the solder mask and if you have traces near the edge of the board it's going to cut into them and it's going to ruin your day. So um, anywhere you're doing v-scoring like that just make sure you peel back the uh, copper from the edges especially if you're doing uh, copper fills and stuff like that like I've done on the top layer here has the copper uh, pour on there or the polygon pour it's a millimeter back from the edge which uh, should be more than enough for the uh, V scoring. So um, that's just something that you need to watch out for when you're panelizing boards like this. And what we want on the bottom of the board here is a tooling strip top and bottom. It needs to be wide enough uh, to handle, you know, handle uh, the uh, sliders on the um, automated machine. And I've made it 20 millimeters uh, thick here, and that should be more than enough. And I, as you can see, I've added a 3.2 millimeter tooling hole there. I've added four of those in the uh, corners like that. And I've added my fiducial here which will be a two-sided uh, fiducial and there's no hole of course and it's a one millimeter uh, sized pad there with solder mask expansion on it so if we go to 3d mode there and we actually zoom in on that you can see that we've got the gold which is the copper like that and the solder mask expanded it expanded around like that and that will actually be the same on the bottom side as well oh, on the bottom side as well there you go. Because all my components are mounted on the bottom, these fiducials really only need to be on the bottom, but uh, put it on the top as well. So now we have to add in uh, some panelization information. That's um, one of the common uh, terms used to specify that we want v-grooving and where we want our routing. So I've uh, prepared that earlier, and here it is. It's just on the mechanical layer. So if I only show you um, the mechanical layer, sorry, I can't get rid of the... Uh, hide the uh, panel at the moment but as you can see I've added in uh, these this routing path here I've actually done the outline of the routing path it's 2.4 millimeters wide and I've just specified it to go like that and I've uh, specified there it is route out so I'm telling the manufacturer giving them specific information to route out that particular path there and I've added in a little pointer here which says uh, V grooving to which means if it matches up with the one on the other side it means V groove or V score that board all the way along like that so the top edge of the board likewise the bottom edge of the board and that one and that one down there so that's all the information that I need to provide on that panel and the manufacturer will, will interpret that they, the bare board PCB manufacturer will interpret that and they will know to actually route out the path between the boards and V-score 
top and bottom. And if they have any uh, questions, then they'll ask you about things like this, but they will actually handle the fine details of then programming those route paths and the v-scoring into their um, into their PCB manufacturing machines and this software to actually do that. So you don't have to worry about what software they're using or what system they're using to actually do that. They will manually take the information you provide on your mechanical layer here and and they, they're, they're knowledgeable and smart enough to know exactly what you mean by v-grooving and routing. And maybe just to be on the safe side here, we might actually drag out this individual uh, thing past, a bit past the end of the board like that, just so, you end, so that you do actually genuinely get a nice sharp uh, corner. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, just place some lines in there like that, and just extend it past there so that they know to actually go so that they will tell their drill to actually go all the way past the edge of the board and you just guarantee that nice clean sharp edge down in there and there you go that's our completed uh panel and that's really all there is to it it's not that hard at all it's not uh, much work even if you have to use even if your package requires you to do individual cut and uh, pace instead of having some automated panel function like this it's it's no drama at all so once we're finished with that and we're happy with it we just generate our uh, gerber file so that's uh, fabrication outputs let's generate our gerber files we're happy we want those layers La yada 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 but we're going to have to include look the paste layer okay because we uh, gtp here the top paste layer and well actually we don't need the top paste layer but we'll do it anyway but the bottom paste layer is important because that's where all of our components are and i've never had to generate or supply that before when i was getting them hand assembled because there is no solder paste stainless steel uh, stencil that's uh, used by uh, the machines to actually put the paste down onto the individual pads but because we're getting this machine assembled designed for manufacture we have to supply that bottom and top paste uh, overlay or, or in this case really only the bottom paste overlay because we've only got components on the bottom but that's what we want to generate so let's actually uh, go into that and uh, generate our Gerbers for that and it'll take a bit longer than usual because it's got a larger panel but bang there it is there's our and if we go into the individual generated files down here here they are microcurrent panel rev2 bottom layer there it is there's the gerber information for the entire panelized thing the bottom overlay it's, it's zoomed in there so but there it is there's the bottom overlay the bottom paste so there's our paste layer that might be hard to see it's in a hard to see color there but that's the paste mask um, that they'll gen use to generate the stainless steel uh, stencil for the paste and the solder paste will only go into those particular areas on the pad so um, and there won't be any solder anywhere else on the board so that's um, how they get the reflow soldering process they'll put the they'll use the stencil apply the paste which applies uh, solder paste to the pads they'll then pick and place the components and it goes into the reflow oven and the solder melts and bingo magic happens and you get your board and there's our solder mask and there's our mechanical layer with all of our uh, routing and uh, tooling information. There it is. We've got our V-groove. We've got our uh, routing paths. And the manufacturer should know that we want that size board, the outer size board manufactured, and the V-grooving and the routing. And it's all there for them. And then we've got the top layer, of course, and uh, top overlay. Let's have a look at that. That's got lots of information takes a while to load because it renders because gerbers actually render um all these things as um individual uh tracks so it's you know they don't actually render uh fonts so that's how gerbers actually work and top paste layer as you can see i've got no components there so there is no top paste layer it just it generated it but it's blank and that's uh, what we have to send to our um, PCB manufacturer. Actually, we don't have to send the paste layer to the manufacturer. The manufac bareboard PCB manufacturer doesn't care about the solder paste. They'll just ignore it. Um, but our assembler will need that file to generate the stencil. And we're not done yet. We have to generate 
our uh, pick and place files and our NC drill files. So we go in, do our NC drill files, so our bareboard manufacturer knows that where to uh, drill the holes and what size. And bingo, there's our whole information. And if, if you actually zoom right in there, there's all the individual holes. But it will generate a text file, uh, basically, that uh, has all that drill information. So you're going to want to supply that to the bareboard manufacturer. If you want to know what those drill files actually look like, here they are. It's uh, the microcurrent panel, Rev2. Uh, it's generated, Altium's generated two files, one for round holes and one for slots. And there is all the uh, Gerber, um, the, sorry, the NC uh, drill information that they need. It specifies the, um, the drill uh, sizes and the um, and the actual uh, locations of where to drill the holes. And same for the slots. I've got some slots in the board and they will know exactly where to do that. And there's my drill report file with the uh, different tools. Uh, they call them uh, tools for each uh, particular drill that's required and the hole sizes, uh, require the drill sizes actually required. And then uh, the NC drill files just use that tool information to tell them where to actually put and uh, NPTH is non-plated through and the other ones are plated through holes. And of course, all this uh, Gerber and NC drill stuff is exactly the same regardless of where we, whether we get an individual board manufactured or a panel. There is no difference. The bare board manufacturer doesn't care. Um, actually, you don't have to do this panelization step. You can actually get your uh, bare board manufacturer to do the panelization and add all the tooling stuff and the routing and things for you. But by the time you specify exactly what you want, you're better off doing it yourself, really. You're better off specifying and laying out your own panel just so there is no confusion. You know exactly what you're going to get um, that's going to go to your assembler. Otherwise, there's too much toing and throwing between you and the uh, bareboard manufacturer. It's just not worth it. Just do the panelization yourself. As you see, it's very simple. It takes no time at all. And one more step, which we're going to need for our PCB assembler, are the pick and place files. So we want to go into assembly outputs, generate pick and place files. And uh, you can do that as a text or a uh, CSV format or both. Then we'll do that and bang. And there are various uh, file formats available for this, but uh, they should be able to, all, of, all the uh, assemblers should be able to accept a basic uh, CSV uh, file like this. And here you go, it's you know C1 there, and it tells you exactly where to place that component and what uh, orientation to place that component on the board. Usually it's the center of the component, but um, in general, the uh, assembler will have to do a lot of tweaking to this file to you know tidy it up and make it suitable for their particular uh, assembly machine and their assembly pick and place uh, software because they're all not the same from different manufacturers and they have different internal methods to do stuff. But that will be all part of your uh, tooling charge that you'll pay for um, uh, doing um, uh, to actually set up uh, the assembly of your board. But that's usually only a one-off fee. So you pay it once and then you can run a million boards through. And that's all there is to the PCB side of it. I've completely panelized my microcurrent design now. Should have done it right back at the start, but oh, I thought I was only going to make a tiny batch of them. It was just easier to do it uh, loose as a one-off board and get it hand assembled. But anyway, I've done the little bit of extra effort now. It's panelized. I pay another tooling charge uh, to get this board done instead of paying no tooling charge just to reorder the loose board. But the tooling charge isn't huge and... Uh, Bingo, I've now got 10 boards and I don't actually have to get this machine assembled if I don't want to. If I want to continue with my hand assembly, you can do that on the panel as well. In fact, it could be nicer the um, if uh, uh, somebody's hand assembling this for you. They may actually prefer on a large panel like this. It just makes handling and things like that easier and it can speed things up because they can do uh, 10 boards at a time. They can place the one component, bang, 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 bang on all the different boards depending on their preferred method. So even if you are going to use pick and place, panelizing like this is not a bad way to go. So now we go on to our next step in the uh, design for manufacture step. And this one can take a hell of a lot of work, a lot more than just panelizing your board. I've said it before, you can spend 80 or 90% of your time actually doing the stuff we're going to do now. So 
what we have to do is go through our um, in our bill of materials for the microcurrent part by part, every single one of them. And if you've got a board that's got 500 parts on it, then you'll have to do this 500 times. But I'll show you one. So let's go for the Max 4239. Go to a good website like DigiKey. And let's Max 4239. And... Uh, Let's, or 3038, 30, sorry, max 4238, and let's take a look at what we've got here. We've got the different packages. The one we need is the uh, SO8 uh, package down here. There it is, the max 4238 ASA plus, and uh, the plus indicates it's uh, lead free here. And if we scroll across, if we take a look at this, it is. Bang, it tells us it's an it's an SO, um, 8 pin SOIC, which is exactly what we need, but it's in a tube. Now, um, some of the assemblers prefer not to have uh, tubes. They can be a bit uh, troublesome, but DigiKey do have 1,507 of those in stock. Uh, they're available one-off, but we would buy them in tube uh, quantities. So we would, so if we click on that and we'll go into there and have a look, at the individual part. Now it doesn't, uh, if you scroll down here, it should tell you how many are in a tube. Tube quantity and standard package, there it is, 100 up there. So there's 100, that, that standard package means that there's 100 of these devices per tube. So if we wanted to buy, if we wanted to assemble 200 of these, for example, then we would buy two tubes worth. Um, otherwise, they're going to give you a partial uh, tube and that might not be so bad but uh, other times it it you know it might be an issue they may supply the extra chips outside of the tube you don't know they may actually repackage them so let's actually if we can avoid uh, tube we probably uh, would like to um, because most manufacturers assemblers these days will prefer the uh, tape and reel so let's go down to the bottom here and look at this one down here, the Max 4238 ASA Plus. It's exactly the same, but it's got a T on the end of it, which uh, to me indicates tape and or tape and reel. And if we scroll scroll across, here it is, 8-pin SOIC in tape and reel packaging. But uh, unfortunately, um, it's a non-stock item, so they don't actually have it in stock. We'd have to get it in. It's 2,500 minimum, so if we actually click on that, then they're only gonna you own you have to buy two thousand five hundred of them, but and it gives you an alternative. So really, that's ruled out. I mean, I'm not gonna buy two and a half thousand of them and uh, not get them in stock and have to wait forever to get them. Bugger that. So it actually gives you alternative packages down here, and it tells us well the tube. Bleh, duh, we've already looked at that. Okay, but at least it's there. It tells you what alternatives. Are available so it looks like at least from digikey um, we have no option but to do uh, the tube but um, an equivalent part is actually the max 4239 so let's have a look at that they're exactly the same chip except they have a different minimum uh, gain and a slightly different bandwidth but we can actually use either in this design as it turns out now here it is the max 4239 ASA plus with the tape in the tape and reel, bang, no stock either, and it looks like the 4239, they've only, in the tube, they've only got 41 stock anyway, that's useless, we'll use the 4238, and it looks like we're stuck with the tubes, at least for this device, I hope the assembler doesn't mind, I'm sure they won't. Alright, let's go on to our next part, the uh, battery holder, the surface mount 2032 battery holder, the part number is 1060K, so let's type that into DigiKey, and... Away we go, and here it is, battery holders, I've been there before clearly, and there's two types available, aha, uh -huh. once again, it's got the 1060TR, that stands for tape and reel, and the regular 1060, which I've been buying up until now, oh look, both of them, they've got a huge amount in stock, 11,000, 12,000, no worries, man, I'd be over the moon if I sold that many microcurrents, that'd be awesome, now, as you can see, the minimum quantity for the uh, non-tape and reel part, the individual, is one. I can just buy one of those for $1.83. Thank you very much, DigiKey. That's awesome. But I'm trying to design for manufacture here. So um, I've, I've bought these ones before, but uh, they have, you know, they actually provide them in a tray. And that's really no good 
for pick and place. And it's not a proper uh, pick and place tray. It's just a, a storage and uh, shipment tray. So it's not really designed for pick and place. So we're really going to have to go for the uh, tape and reel option here. And as it turns out, I'm going to have to buy 500 minimum. Because if, if you scroll down, the standard package there is 500. So we have to buy a reel of 500 of these things at a dollar 25 each but that's the price you got to pay and if you uh, want to only assemble 200 of these well they don't give you the digi reel option the re-reeling option which we'll see later like they do for some other parts so really you are stuck with buying those 500 items if you want them on a tape and reel at least from digi key you might have to go somewhere else if uh, that you know, if you only want to make 100 or 200 boards and you can't justify spending, you can't uh, absorb that extra uh, cost of those 300 um, parts, which you may not use. So, you know, you've got to weigh up these and you've got to weigh this up for each individual component in your design. It can get crazy. So now let's go and look at another part, our uh, Texas Instruments voltage monitor here, and let's see what we get. There's quite a few of them here, and uh, what we want is to scroll over. We want uh, cut tape, which is how I normally buy them. Cut tape means that you, like, they're minimum of one. So, the, you know, the person at the DigiKey factory, the Oompa Loompas there, will just cut off your one little SOT23 chip and put it in a little baggie for you and send it to you if you want, and it'll cost you a whopping uh, dollar for that one part. And they've got 3000 in stock. Not a problem, but it tells you alternative package is available and it's available in tape and reel and it's available in a digi reel awesome now the difference is as you can see the uh, tape and reel here is uh that is a very low minimum quantity of 250 for the tape and reel i was expecting that like minimum to be like well up the top here 3000 there it is there's a tape and reel option Looks like there's two tapes and reel options for this one. The one up the top here, take a look at this. Minimum quantity of 3,000, and you pay 28 cents each because they're in volume, and it's tape and reel, uh, but it looks like the minimum is 3,000 on that one reel. So this one, tape and reel down here, is rather interesting in that you can get 250 of them for 53 cents. I, I don't know what's going on there. And they offer you the digi key, the digi reel as well, which is the re reeling service. And this is incredibly flexible. So they're giving you like four different options here to purchase your products. And this is, this is the advantages of buying through uh, someone like digi key. You're going to pay, you know, you might pay for more for it, but you can really kit up easily for your projects doing this. Now, as you can see, it, uh, all these alternate packages here are available and the minimum uh, quantities and it looks like the standard package is 250 and it says tape and reel so I guess that probably comes from the manufacturer TI themselves on a little mini reel but uh, let's say you needed a thousand of them um, you could buy multiple mini reels you could buy multiple four of these reels or you could go for the uh, digi reel. Where was it? Let's have a look at the digi reel. Let's go back. And there it is. Here's the digi reel one. And let's take a look at this because this is interesting. They give you an extra. Let's say we wanted our thousand. They give you an extra box and you can calculate the price uh, for the thing. And they tell you a $7 reeling fee will be applied to each reel ordered so um, and they're non-returnable of course because they've done something custom for you and then you can calculate the price for a thousand and they'll then put a thousand of these devices on a reel just for you so that's a trade-off between buying the full reel from the manufacturer of three thousand and four of those smaller reels because then the manufacturer uh, the uh, PCB assembler if you've only got the little reel of 250 and you want to put a thousand boards through in one run, then they're going to have to stop the machine and change it, change that reel at 250, and that stops the line, costs you more time, and they're going to charge you more for that. So if you know you're going to manufacture a thousand boards, it's better to actually get a thousand of these on the reel. But remember, as I said uh, earlier, you there might be some loss in this. So, you know, if you were going to manufacture a thousand boards, you might want say 1100 or something like that and if they're real expensive devices and you can't afford to lose any 
you better tell the manu the assembler that they're uh, really expensive parts and, and try not to waste them, please. And they'll handle them more carefully and they'll put extended tapes on and uh, things like that to ensure um, that there's less loss or zero loss. But generally, they throw comp these components away like they're jelly beans. So uh, just be prepared for some wastage. And there it is. Quantity, 1100 35 cents each, $386. If you wanted to manufacture a thousand boards, that's what you'd get. Awesome. And I would do exactly the same step for every item in my bomb. But thankfully, the microcurrent doesn't have many parts in the bomb, so it shouldn't take me too long to do this. But I've got to go through and order all these things on reels or uh, tubes, if that's good enough. Preferably uh, reels for everything. Every one of these items, I might have to buy more than what I need, so I've got to try and absorb that cost, hopefully sell enough um, uh, units in the end to actually um, you know, cover that extra cost which I've paid for possibly extra components which I'm not going to use. So that's the trade-off with um, machine assembling, pick and place uh, assembling um, your boards like this, whereas previously I'd order 50 parts, 50 boards, There'd be practically zero wastage from my hand assembler, Vutronics, and, um, you know, everything was easy and sweet. Now, it's a bit more of a gamble. You've got to put more effort into it. Uh, but uh, hopefully, um, the uh, quality should be uh, really, you know, 100% uh, very repeatable, and uh, it should, in the long run, be cheaper. But there you go. That's the design for manufacturing, just a basic product uh, like this microcurrent there's a fair bit of work into it but it's uh it's worthwhile in the end and if you're designing a really high volume product this sort of stuff is absolutely essential so i'll uh keep you updated on where the uh microcurrent is and i'll show you the board when i get it back the finished panel and things like that and uh yeah, if you want to uh, sign up for one, then uh, there's a form on the uh, website. You can sign up and register your interest for one so that I um, actually know how many uh, people want one and how many I've got to get manufactured. So I hope you enjoyed that. Catch you next time.